Thank you so much, Margot, Sue, what a beautiful introduction. And welcome to you all. It's such a joy to see you, although we are in our little rectangles, in a large <laughs> rectangle. I am imagining us all together tonight in a circle. And I look so forward to the day that you can actually visit us on our farm here in Western New York post pandemic. This is your cordial invitation. <laughs> and know that you are always welcome. We have lots of events, Margot mentioned. <laughs> Watermelons, <laughs> indeed, and every August we have a great big watermelon in the dahlias party because we grow hundreds of watermelon each year just for the organic seeds inside. So then we throw a big party and it's all you can eat watermelon. <laughs> so stay tuned, keep in touch. And I'd love to dive in with this quote first from Robin Wall Kimmerer. I think that the service berries, and service berries, imagine they're also called June berries or shad bush, a small shrubby tree with these delicious apple cherry like fruits. I think that the service berries show us another model, one based upon reciprocity rather than accumulation, where wealth and security come from the quality of our relationships, not from the illusion of self sufficiency. Without gift relationships with birds and bees, service berries would disappear from the planet, even if they hoarded their abundance. Perching atop the wealth ladder, they would not save themselves from the fate of extinction if their partners did not share in their abundance. Hoarding won't save us. All flourishing is mutual. Thank you for those words, Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And I would just love to share that when I read that and as we're planning our farm for the next season and as we are all planning our gardens, I just invite us to think of our gardens, not as like me, mine, my garden, but our garden, as in our community gardens. Who needs food in your community? Think of humans, but also frogs <laughs> and of your friends and who has legs and who doesn't have legs that will benefit from you having a garden and how can you plan your garden with them in mind so that that abundance can be amplified across species and across generations. So welcome, my name is Petra. Petra Page Man, as Margot mentioned, and I am, yeah, I love seeds. I love growing seeds, really, because I love food. And I love food because I love to share food with people that I love. Um, and I'm delighted to share with you so much of what I've learned about saving seeds. I grew up in my father's garden, about 10 miles away from where I now stand, that way. <laughs> So helpful, I know, <laughs> here in the Western New York Finger Lakes, uh, just outside Canandaigua Lake. And our, his garden was not large, but it was huge to me. It was about a 30 by 30. And that garden, I took for granted. If you had asked little seven-year-old Petra what I love to do, I never would have told you starting seeds or gardening <laughs> or saving seeds. Uh, and I also wouldn't have told you I love to brush my teeth or <laughs> my shoes. It was just something I was fortunate enough to take for granted. So I'll always be grateful to my father for sowing seeds and for saving seeds with me in his garden. And for over a decade, I worked on other small organic farms across the country and around the world. And I grew watermelon once in a while in my father's garden, but it would never grow actual watermelons that we would eat. <laughs> and I've never been a practical person ever, but I remember being little and growing watermelon again and har not harvesting watermelon again and being like, Dad, watermelon is a waste of garden space. <laughs> <laughs> and little did I know, I just needed different seeds to have different experiences. So now it's a joy to share. When people ask if we have children, I, we say yes, and great, 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 great grandchildren. <laughs> and they grow us more than we grow them. <laughs> and you can eat them. <laughs> we only say that if we think they have a sense of humor. So it's a joy to share watermelon, like 
August ambrosia seeds of wa watermelon like this so that other little girls in short seasons, little boys, all people in short seasons can grow and eat watermelon. So let's dive in. We're gonna spend the next perhaps 20, 25 minutes just diving into an infographic actually that my friend Sal and I made a few years ago all about seed starting and the common mistakes to avoid. And we'll go through that. And then the rest of our time is just a Q&A together. And I'd love if you have clarifying questions, jump right in and just ask away anytime. And for the bigger questions, we'll save that for the Q&A and I look so forward. And before I share my screen with that Q&A, I'd just like to invite you to send me an email on petra at fruitionseeds.com and we'll send you an email that has this infographic that I'm about to share with you so that you can have it and download it and enjoy it. On, uh, in that same email, I'd love to share with you some other resources like our Rise and Shine. Um, we have this as a beautiful book, but it's also an ebook. So I'll send you the ebook as well. It's 40 pages and you'll find direct sewing charts and see and transplanting charts and step-by-step -step awesome info. So if you like the, all the colors and beautiful pages, I don't blame you. <laughs> and you'll find those on our website and the ebook is perfect for black and white, just home download and printing at home. So I'd love to send you that. And um, yeah, we have a lot of other wonderful resources, friends. So jump right in, don't be shy. And without further ado, oh my gosh, I'll show you this. We made this little planting calendar. So it has, here's a bunch of months and then here's a bunch of varieties. So there's, you know, when you can expect to direct sow or transplant or, you know, harvest. It's kind of a baby encyclopedia. So I'll send you a digital version of this and we send this postcard out with each of our orders as well. And you'll see, not everything is sown at the same time. So let me not get ahead of myself <laughs> and I'll dive right into sharing the screen. Um, and I'm looking so forward to sharing this infographic with you. So yeah, it's seven essential seed starting tips. So number one, resist starting everything at once. It's one of the easiest mistakes to make, especially because it's just so exciting <laughs> and you want to show so everything you've got on the day that you're most excited. But here's the thing. You want to make sure that you're starting everything at the right time. And there, it's not like there's an exact day, but there's a week, two weeks for a lot of things that is your critical window. And for many of those things, you'll see on the back of our packets, um, we have these beautiful packets and there's a bunch of growing info on the back. There's also a quick reference guide across the side. So you'll see it says when to sow six to eight weeks before final frost. And if you don't have our packets and it doesn't say that on the packet, go ahead and download Rise and Shine starting seeds with these because you'll see there's the download of the charts of there um, of exactly when to sow what. Because let's be honest as well, like our climate is changing. And so when we're looking at our final frost date, it's not just, you know, there isn't an exact date. It's really a few weeks for us here at Fruition Seeds on our farm in zone five in the Finger Lakes. It's anywhere from, our final frost is anywhere from mid-May to early June. So we plan also on, on planning on the frost being later, just because those their seedlings much appreciate being younger rather than being younger and when they're planted rather than being older and more stressed because here's another key young unstressed transplants are more abundant every time compared to older more stressed transplants which is counterintuitive right especially here in short seasons <laughs> like it's really easy to think we live in a short season i need to have older transplants so they're going to be quicker to maturity and more abundant in our short seasons and it just doesn't work that way so 
yeah, starting on the early on the earlier side often means you're actually harvesting later and certainly less. So we love, especially with peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, plants that are basil too, that are really not loving of cold temperatures. They're not only, they're frost sensitive, like 32 degrees, they're gonna die. <laughs> but they're also cold sensitive. So honestly, less than 50 degrees, they're like, take me back to the Mediterranean. Take me back to Central America. <laughs> <laughs> take me back to any equatorial zone. <laughs> so those cold loving, those warm loving crops, anytime they're experiencing cold, i.e. less than 50 degrees, they're stressed. So it's not just the frost date that you're looking at. It's really that like, it's not only going to not frost, it's not going to dip below the 50s either. So that's where planting out your calendar and I'll show you too we have this across the seasons calendar which is a perpetual calendar so that we can actually look at and record our frost dates and our seeding dates and our harvest dates and all of the above so you'll see here in April as a perpetual calendar there's dates but instead of days of the week there's actually years so you can actually be reading um, show so you can see here in early april <laughs> i'm harvesting wild nettles and <laughs> the speaking of wood thrushes return but i'm also sharing that in mini blocks we planted tomatoes eggplants and our final peppers on the 4th of april so and the idea of across the seasons, right, is that across the seasons, you can be paying attention to all of these little notes and amplifying your abundance as a result. So let's dive into number two, starting the seeds at the right time. So it's true, too early just equals more work, <laughs> more work for you. You'll have to pot up more, you'll have to water more, and it's way more work for your plants. And it's just stressful for your plants. So earlier you have to pot up more and more often, and it just, it, it's counterintuitive, but younger, less stressed transplants are happier every time. So da da da. <laughs> Number three, soil blocks are the dream. And how many of you have ever used soil blocks or have a soil blocker? Um, they're pretty brilliant inventions. So instead of having something like six packs or something that is plastic disposable, single use, or maybe you have them for a few years, but something that's ultimately going in the garbage, you have these things where you put soil in and press them out. And then you have these cubes of soil, which naturally air prune, and they are just brilliant. The soil per volume is greater. So the nutrients per volume is greater. And we start over 10,000 seedlings on our farm <laughs> every year. And we do them all in soil blocks because the plants are so much healthier. And here's where I'm sad to say we have soil blockers generally, but we've sold out of them at this exact moment. And we get ours from Great Britain, this wonderful company that thankfully Great Britain is taking COVID pretty seriously. So <laughs> the good news is they're taking COVID seriously. And the bad news is we have no idea when we're getting more in stock. So I just want to mention the brilliance of soil blockers, but know that Cell trays are a solid second. And just be sure, although they're less soil in each one, and you want to be, and they easily get root bound as they as those roots hit the edge and then suddenly go around and around and around trying to get out of the cell tray. So that's where number four comes in. Remove air gaps. So especially for, this doesn't count for soil blocks because you're naturally just compressing them full of soil. But for cell trays and if you're using peat pots or anything else that's a yogurt cup container like we used to start seeds in when I was a girl, you want to remove the air gaps by gently tamping them down like, um, right along your starting table tray, whether it's a your kitchen counter or something in your greenhouse, just tamp them down three times, not super hard, but solidly. So that way it's making sure that those air, air gaps are just compressing and you have more soil per volume. So I'll never forget the one day 
<laughs> I was uh, working on a farm in Maine and there was one tray of broccoli that we clearly didn't tamp down <laughs> because as we were taking the seedlings out, all of the seedling roots were just all the there were there were air gaps so there wasn't solid soil and it was just like the roots didn't transfer well they were really disturbed and you could see that like the seven this is a 72 tray right 72 little holes and you could see those 72 broccoli plants were the ones that were way more stressed for the rest of the season so yes if you are starting in cell trays hot little tip <laughs> And next, a heat mat changes everything. So yes, heat mats are kind of magical. Oh, pardon, Mouse, where did you go? <laughs> so yes, a heat mat changes everything. I remember when I was in middle school and my father, we got a heat mat to start our seeds on. <laughs> And I was like, wow, dad, <laughs> why didn't we do this years ago? <laughs> it's because they help seeds germinate so much faster. And they literally, they increase the germination rate and also just the vigor of the plants is incredible. So it's helpful no matter what seeds you're starting, but especially if you're starting tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those solanaceous crops that grew up have evolved millions of years in really warm tropical places they want that heat mat. Also, a lot of flowers, especially perennial flowers, perennial herbs, they just take their time compared to annuals to sprout. And so that additional heat, the 75, 78 degrees is the optimal germination temperature for the vast majority of seeds. Peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, it's 80. And honestly, some peppers like habaneros and habanada, it's 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just way warmer than is than most of us keep our homes. And thank goodness. <laughs> and so having that heat mat, and we share ones that we love on our website that are the perfect size for a single cell tray. And that heat mat just simply increases the soil in your tray. 15, 18 degrees above the ambient temperature of the room around them. So it's very handy um, and makes a huge difference. And you'll likely have it for the rest of your life. <laughs> so heat, yes, heat mats make all the difference. Um, oh yes, there's a great little note. They do, that does mean that you will need to, if you're using a heat mat, water more. We'll get to watering in a few minutes. So next, let's talk about lights because light equals life. And if your seedlings are starting to lean toward the window, it's already too late, they're stressed for light. And it's really important at that point, pretty much to start over. Once your seedlings are going like this, it's just bad news. So your goal is to prevent them from going like this. Um, and so here's the thing. For some plants, for example, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, they are more like six to eight week old seedlings in your home. Other things like if you're starting spinach or zinnias or basil, those are just four week transplants. And so if you're growing transplants four weeks or less indoors, it's not the best, but you can get away with them being grown indoors, not in a greenhouse. and not needing light. But if you're actually trying to grow four weeks or more transplants, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, like ground cherries or tomatillos, how many of you have grown and loved ground cherries? Um, it's really important that you have really high quality light or a, a greenhouse with full day light. A sunny south facing window is not going to cut it. And there's a lot of snake oil in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and grow lights are one of them. Already, I've received a number of emails from people starting seeds under very expensive grow lights. And they're clearly not lights that are grow lights. You know, to me, you know, this looks like a light above me in my kitchen. <laughs> but to a plant, they're like, mm, 
mm, not so much. Plants, fun fact, need the, of course, green wavelength to a uh, red and blue wavelengths to actually photosynthesize. And the color between that and the Roy G. Biv <laughs> rainbow world is green, which they don't use to photosynthesize, which is why they reflect green, which is why plants look and are green to our eyes. So not all lights have those predominant, like full spectrum, but predominating red and blue wavelengths that are specifically set up for, for plants to thrive. So we have some lights um, on our website actually that our friend Vic makes right here in the US. They're awesome and we're really, I, I've been terrified of recommending grow lights for years because I just think they all kind of suck. <laughs> <laughs> until we bet <met> big. <laughs> so yes, it's not a big deal if you don't have a light. Um, just make sure that you're only growing those four week or less old transplants. And the nice thing about grow lights, they grow great seedlings, but also awesome microgreens all winter. Actually, I have some over here. Underneath our, <laughs> our light, we have some lovely microgreens. And pretty soon they, they'll, that light will transition to growing seedlings. And in the meantime, we can have our microgreens and eat them too. So next, just a reminder that healthy seedlings are short, stout, and deep green. So that shortness is a relationship of light, right? That's if you have leggy, which is kind of the fun term for an overstretched, light stress seedling stretching for the light. So it's your with our lights, um, it's six inches above the top foliage of your seedlings to help them get the optimum amount of light they need, but not make them taller or shorter. We actually grew a, some romaine under them just to find out like how close is too close. And we grew some romaine with the light like an inch above their leaves. And the leaves instead of going like this were like this <laughs> against the ground. It was kind of cute and also very devastating. That was the last time we experimented. <laughs> <laughs> in that way. <laughs> so, and stout. Yeah, so many people think that like the taller the seedling is, the better, but your goal really is to have them be as short as possible and as stout so that the stem is nice and strong. Well, we're, we're going to talk about hardening off here in just a few moments and that acclimation period from life in your kitchen to life in the great outdoors, <laughs> right? With this thing called wind <laughs> and rain that sometimes isn't gentle and temperatures that go like this. My kitchen is pretty consistent. <laughs> I imagine yours is too. If we are some of the most fortunate people on the planet, if that is the case. And so having that acclimation period is really important. And the shorter and stouter the plant is, the less sappy and, and, and prone to snapping that stem is. So yes, healthy seedlings are young, not stressed, and short, stout, and deep green. So here are some simple solutions to the most common mistakes that we see. Egg cartons are great for eggs, <laughs> but not for seedlings. <laughs> And please disregard anything Pinterest might have to tell you otherwise. There are countless pictures of very quaint pictures, countless pictures of quaint plants growing in egg cartons, and it's just a facade. <laughs> and there's plenty of ways to be resourceful and plenty of ways to be creative. And this is essential now more than ever. And there are better ways to do it. Actually, toilet paper rolls cut into one inch sections are remarkably wonderful at like being little <laughs> seed starting situations. Also takeout containers make great alternatives to just, you know, getting trays. So there's a lot of different ways that you can reuse things in your home. Egg cartons are not one of them. There's way too little soil for the plants to have much to do. And then transplanting them from that curvaceous um, context into any other context is just a mess for their roots. So please, and they try out super easily. So please do yourself the favor and your plants especially the favor 
um, and <laughs> resist starting seeds in egg cartons. And also it's really easy to sow too many seeds per block. Only sowing two to three seeds per cell or soil block is perfect. If you do have a mini blocker, you want one seed for each of these little spaces, but otherwise two to three seeds is fine. If you have older seed, you could, you could sow four or five to hedge your bets. But honestly, especially if the seeds are coming from a high quality seed source, um, I'll toot my own horn. <laughs> we germination test all our seeds and the national germination average is actually 65%. Isn't that appalling? It's like over almost 50% seed in a seed packet could legally be dust. <laughs> and they're still for sale. So that's the national average. So if we have less than 90% germination, we don't put them in our packets. So it's just one of the ways that we like to sleep at night. <laughs> and so you can feel really confident that sowing two seeds in a cell is going to be plenty. So in that way too, your seedlings, as you can see in this little infographic, and thanks again for Sal for making this awesome infographic. You can see above the ground, it might not seem like there's that much going on, but fun fact, seeds grow roots before they send up their shoots. And so there's always way more going on underneath the ground than there is above. And so even though you might think there's, you know, and that you're not stressing your plants out to have five or six little seedlings that then you're thinning down to one, it actually makes a lot more sense for those lovely little plants of yours to have less of them to compete with each other above the ground and below the ground. And also when you're thinning them, I highly recommend snipping them with scissors so that you're not disturbing the roots of the plant that you are selecting for. And you wanna select against and that plant that is, that seedling that is, you can see on the right here, on the far right, if there's one plant that's a little taller and stronger and straighter, that's the one you wanna select for. And depending on the plant, sometimes like peppers, tomatoes, you can parse them apart and plant them in separate cells and then you can save them both. Um, and, but, other plants, you know, like certainly, and cucumbers, for example, there's, I'll send you a whole list as well. Um, and you'll see in our rise and shine guide, there are plants to just not <laughs> transplant. Their root systems are really sensitive. And so any kind of disturbance is very stressful for them. <laughs> so yes, overseed, not overseeding is key. And also bottom watering is your new best friend. So let's talk about bottom watering. Watering is one of the biggest um, roadblocks for people of knowing when and how and too little water is definitely not good and too much water is equally not good. So let's talk. With your trays, it's important to be starting seeds in basically two trays. And they don't have to be these exactly, but the core is this. You can see the light coming through the bottom of this tray, which is awesome because we want water to be in excess draining away from our seedlings. There are certainly lots of plants, kelp and those beautiful kelp forests that come to mind. There are so many plants that have evolved to live in standing water but most of them have not. And if you're planting them in your garden, <laughs> they are solidly terrestrial <laughs> rather than aquatic plants. And so it's important as seedlings that the soil is draining below them as well. So yes, you need a tray that can drain. And if you're like me and you're in your kitchen, <laughs> That's all well and good, Petra, but that's going to make a mess. So that's why we have our bottom tray, which note does not have holes. Top tray has holes, bottom tray does not. And the top tray goes in the bottom tray and then brilliantly <laughs> they nest. And so this is where bottom watering is simply lifting up the edge and pouring some water into this bottom tray without holes so that they're isn't so much water that it's coming up against the top tray, but it's always, but it's beneath. And so it's literally 
evaporating, condensing on the top of this bottom tray, wicking up from below, keeping moisture at the roots where your plants actually need it most. And then if you are overhead watering, just be sure that you are letting that top layer of the soil dry out beautifully in between waterings. And it doesn't have to be much dry, literally like the top millimeter, the top micrometer, <laughs> just the top layer of soil. The barest little skin of soil needs to be totally dry and then water them. And that's because damping off is really common. It's this suite of different bacteria and fungi that all have the same effect of kind of munching on the stems of your seedlings and they all fall over and it's really sad and they just go like wildfire once you have one plant this basically the tray is done within 24 30 hours so it's really sad but it's very preventable um and one of the things that we have in that um, rise and shine starting seeds with ease book is a whole guide to um preventing damping off. And the main thing is just making sure that you're not bottom watering. And then if you are overhead watering that you're letting that top layer of soil um, dry out. So yes, next let's talk about that acclimation of seedlings, also called hardening off. And this is one of the key things that especially beginning gardeners, just you don't, <laughs> who tells you? <laughs> I'm here to tell you. <laughs> so transitioning your seedlings to life outside for five to seven days before transplanting them vastly helps them um, be more productive, more healthy, more happy, more vigorous, less stressed. And so you want to you know they're acclimating to temperatures dipping down at night. They're also acclimating to this phenomena called wind and rain. Don't water them in that time unless you really feel like you have to if it's really hot. And also you're acclimating them as best you can to actual sunlight. And I'm quite Polish, so I understand sunburning very easily. And your transplants will too. They've been sitting in your kitchen. If it's a pepper for something like six to eight weeks. And although our full spectrum LED lights are awesome, they are not the sun. <laughs> and so a full day of sun will very quickly toast <laughs> your plants. And it probably won't kill them, but it will set them back. And so if you can gradually clean them out or even putting them in, putting them outside on days that are overcast, that totally counts for adjusting them, acclimating them to that light as they go. So that is a, oh yes, this little point. Any solanaceous seedlings, bring them back inside if the nights are going to be under less than 50 degrees. So solanaceous, that's just your plants in your solanid or um, your nightshade family. So peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, ground cherries, tomatillos. They just, it's not that they don't like freezing temperatures. They don't like cold and anything less than 50 degrees will cause especially peppers to pout. I don't know if any of you have grown peppers and seen them just kind of sit there and they might put on a few leaves, but they don't really flower and they don't grow much fast. <laughs> like has that ever happened to you? And peppers just pout when they are stressed. And um, so, and temperature is one of the biggest reasons that peppers get stressed in our short seasons. So our fifth, thing to keep in mind is that everyone makes mistakes. They're inevitable, they're fabulous opportunities to learn and grow. And gardens grow us as much, if not more than we grow them. And gardens don't do it alone and neither do we. And so I'm really grateful to share this evening with you. And I really hope that this isn't the last time that we're in communication, whether it's Dirty Gaia and the Rhinecliff Library or any number of other ways. You know, you'll find us on Facebook, on Instagram. We have a beautiful email that we send out each week. And when you find yourself in the Finger Lakes, I hope that you'll stop by our farm post-pandemic days as well. 
there's so many ways that we can all be learning and growing and sharing together. And I'm delighted to stop sharing my screen and just dive into some Q&A with you all. Should I read some of the questions that have been in the chat? Oh, perfect. Okay. So going back to the very beginning, what sort of soil mixture do you suggest for the pots? Yeah, so great question. You have a lot of different options. And from our, from Fruition Seeds, we actually have a pre-made, what we start all of our seedlings in, we, we share it in 32 um, in great big bags <laughs> so that we send through the mail. So we also have this lovely container of um, do-it-yourself potting mix minerals so that you can add some other ingredients and it's a really easy recipe on the back. So you can actually make from this little box of minerals 80 quarts of really high quality potting mix, which is nice because honestly, most potting mix kind of isn't great. <laughs> like when potting mix, often it's a potting, it's a medium for growth, but there aren't a lot of nutrients and the nutrients are the expensive part. <laughs> And we live in a very commodified capitalist colonial world that thinks that it's great if you give me that amount of money and I give you the cheapest product I can give you. So because the minerals are the expensive part, that's why we share that um, DIY um, mineral mix so that you can actually have the minerals and, and you can augment other um other potting mixes with that, as well as make your own. And that is a perfect mix for um, whether you're starting soil blocks, the soil blocks, you wanna make sure that that texture has, is, it has either like a lot of peat moss or a lot of coconut core, which breaks my heart because neither of those are renewable resources. Coconut core much more so than peat bogs. And we're experimenting to see what other ingredients we can find that the thing that makes that such magical media is that it compresses while still maintaining pore space, air space. So you can compress it but there's still plenty of access because it, roots need air as much as you don't want those air pockets. <laughs> you, they, all roots need air. That's why clay can be such a difficult um, medium to grow in in your garden um, because you know, roots can't actually like grow where there isn't air. Um, so yeah, thank you for asking and I hope that you find some really high quality potting mix really close by. And if you don't have some close by and um, we have some on our website as well, and that's fruitionseeds.com. And from Carrie Lee Hinkson. So can you put the soil blocks dirt directly on the heat map? match yes or does there need to be a barrier or a tray between oh i love that question yes you want to put them in a tray um something because you still need you need to water them and so having them on that heat mat on something that you can water and not make a mess of your kitchen <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have um, on in our greenhouse where we're starting the vast majority of our seeds. We have just great big tables and then great big heat mats on them. And then we actually have kind of our end walls for our greenhouse is this corrugated plastic material. And so we actually just the leftovers from our end walls, we cut into essentially trays like this, but instead of having lips, they're just you know, something that we can then move around on and, and they're right on the heat mat. So that's another option, but that's only for spaces that you don't mind the water running everywhere. You know, our greenhouse <laughs> is set up for water to be anywhere, any given moment. <laughs> our kitchen a little less so. <laughs> so yeah, if you're growing in your kitchen, have that heat mat beneath your tray and then you have them right in your tray so that you can water them and bottom water them and it's the best of both worlds. And Carly, also follow-up question. Do you ever have to worry about the, your microgreens becoming root bound on the edges? Do you mean root microgreens or seedlings? Well, microgreens, I believe, Carrie Lee. <laughs> 
As microgreens are so young, we're generally harvesting them. I'll go snag them. We're generally harvesting um, our microgreens 10 days after we sow them. So this is arugula. This is some um, a, a, a mix of different um, radishes. So like red and purple and different radish colors. And then this is broccoli. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we sowed, we sowed these not even a week ago. So we're harvesting them basically within 10 days. There are some longer and check out, we have a whole, oh my goodness, we have all these online courses. We have a microgreens online course. That's just a mini course. So we call it our micro course <laughs> since it's about microgreens. And we also have a seed starting academy that's totally free in those online courses as well. But yeah, root bound microgreens aren't really a thing since you're just like literally harvesting them 10 days later. Um, so I imagine you mean seedlings, but feel free to <laughs> feel free to clarify, my friend. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so do, do you pull them um, when you harvest a microgreen? Do you just pull it out or do you snip it like you? Um, yeah, we snip them. Snip it. Okay, I guess I was wondering with um, the soil blocks, I think someone else asked this question too about how far apart to place them in a tray because I was thinking you would just smash them all together and then if they were in a tray, like around the edges, maybe they would start to go root bound mm. with the seedlings. Um, but then I saw your illustration and I'm like, oh, she's spacing them apart. So maybe that would prevent... Well, yeah, um, it's in the, it's a little deceiving in the infographic because they look far apart. We actually, you can see there's one, two, three, four soil blocks in this uh, soil blocker. So this, we literally are putting them in the trays that close, that adjacent. Oh, now is perfect for okay. just, if you're, they could become a tiny bit root bound if they're right against the edge of the the edge of your tray like this yeah but because it having this, that little amount of metal in between those blocks all they need to become to air prune is just that little whisper that tiny oh, little nice. i mean roots for millions of years have been evolving when they hit air to just go the other way so it doesn't take much which is the great news and there is some sometimes if there if you have those uh, too close to each other for too long <laughs> they're like if you if you have like for example maybe a lettuce transplant that these are this is a good size for three to four week old transplants if you're if they're longer than three four weeks in these um in these soil blocks they are going to just start to be like, there's got to be life after this block. <laughs> and at that point, it's not that the blocks are slouching, but they are starting to compress a little bit. And so you can, we, we, that's when we start to see, especially down toward the bottom, they can, those roots start to interlock. But if you're planting them, you're sowing your seeds at the right time, and then you're transplanting your transplants out, um, it's not generally an issue at all, which is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And Janelle asks if you could uh, say again the brands of the blocks that you like. Oh, yes. Actually, I don't know if this particular... So we... Ladbroke. Ladbroke is the company that makes them, but I don't know if you can get them directly from them. Um, so they just... It's like if you want to get darn tough socks. You can't get it straight from the company. You have to get them like from REI and other co companies that are selling them. So, um, so we, so we share them and I don't know where else you can find them. Honestly, right now, I know there's been a huge, huge, oh, Addie says you can order from down tough. Oh, great. I love being wrong. <laughs> yes, that's great news. <laughs> Note to self. Um, but sadly, um, I love them too, but yeah, sadly you can't order them straight from, straight from England and straight from that company. I'm sure we can still find them somewhere, but there's, they're going to be in really short order right now. Okay. One day we'll get a bunch more in. <laughs> then moving along to Debbie Chapman asks, is there, does anyone have a method of planting carrot seeds? So very little thinning is needed. Oh, yes. You can get pelletized carrot seed. 
So it's much more expensive and it's like literally pelletized seed means that the people, the company has gone in and coated that seed with enough other inert material so that you can be confident that you're planting, you know, it's much easier to plant, whether it's with your fingers or if you have like a little cedar that you can be planting a seed every inch um, or every three inches or whatever, you know, spacing that you're, you're hoping to spend space. So palletized carrot seed, totally. Um, high mowing organic seeds and also Johnny's organic seeds are the two companies that I love that leap to mind that I know have pelletized carrot seed. Um, we don't because it's really expensive and we don't know how to make that ourselves. Um, and it's generally something that farmers like large scale market farmers are using, but yeah, you can totally get some from, from Johnny's and from high mowing. And Cliff asks, how do you know when to fertilize the seedlings? <gasps> Wonderful question. So when they're hungry, of course, they'll tell you. They'll tell you because their leaves are getting yellow green instead of deep blue green. And as a general rule, we don't feed any of our seedlings that are four weeks or less. So again, that's where on the back of our packets has a bunch of great info. And also just in our Rise and Shine book, there's we have our transplant and also our direct sow charts. And so that'll have, you know, those weak guidelines so that you can um, know how many weeks to expect to, those seedlings to be. So as a general rule, if you have four week transplants or less, you don't need to be feeding them beyond just start with really high quality compost-based organic potting mix and you'll be good to go. If you are growing peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, lavender, oregano that need four, five, six, eight weeks before frost to be indoors. At that point, we are definitely feeding them, but after we've potted them up. So we're potting them up from, you know, if you have them in a cell tray or a six pack, once they get their second set of true leaves, and you know, if they're in a soil block too, once they get their second set of true leaves, that's when we pot them up into a four inch pot. And at that point, we start feeding them with a foliar feed of fish emulsion. Ooh, and I brought some, yay. Um, a foliar feed of fish emulsion where we spray it on their leaves. You can also root drench it and put it right, right there on their roots. And so every week we're giving them that little boost. And it's one, one ounce of our fish and kelp emulsion into every gallon of water. So a little of this goes a long way. And you want to only make as much of it as you can use right then. In its concentrated form, it has quite a shelf life, but in its dilute form, it doesn't have, um, it doesn't last long. So um, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, let's see, after cut, this is from Casey. After cutting the microgreens, do they regrow? Cutting microgreens, they do not. So if you were growing baby greens, yes, because you're not cutting off their apical bud, but microgreens, here, I'll pluck this marvelous little purple radish. This is fun. <laughs> so microgreen world, world microgreen. <laughs> so there's a little bit of root and that delicious stem. And there are the cotyledons at those first primordial leaves. They're actually not true leaves. If you can imagine a peanut, when it get, gets broken in half, there's kind of the two halves, right? Those are the two, it's a dicot, not a monocot. And there's the two cotyledons that if when that peanut germinates, it would have two leaves and each one of those little broccoli or radish, every brassica looks basically the same um, configuration, the shape of the leaves. And so the growth point, the apical growth point is in between these two leaves. And you can't even see, it hasn't even emerged yet. It'll, in a few days perhaps, there'll be another little sprout growing from in between these two cotyledons that will then start to create true leaves and the plant will grow from there. So if you have lettuce, 
you can like cut and come again lettuce. The idea is that you can cut off the leaves above the apical growth point and the apical growth point will continue to grow. Brilliant. But in the case of a microgreen, this is the whole deal. <laughs> you, to eat a microgreen, you cut with scissors as low as you possibly can. And then there you go, that's your microgreen. <laughs> but there goes its apical growth point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yes, microgreens, you, alas, are delicious, but they don't regrow. <laughs> Thank you for asking. And I do recommend those radishes. They're delicious. Looks delicious. Who's that? Oh my God. Pancho. Yes. How did you know? <laughs> Pancho's ready for his evening ski. <laughs> um, more about soil. Yes. What soil combination for soil blocks? Same soil as you discussed? Yeah, yeah. Actually, what we have on our website um, is actually from Vermont Compost Company, which we love. Speaking of darn tough and fabulous Vermont companies. And we love their Fort V mix, which is perfect for soil blocks. So that's what we use on our farm and we share bags of it online. Um, and we also check out our blog and also our Seed Starting Academy, which is our free um, online course, just a deep dive into this and so, 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 so much more, um, where we share recipes for soil mix, um, depending on what your, what your needs are. For something like six packs and cell trays, Basically any soil will do for your soil, for your soil blocks. You want something that has a high percentage, like 50% of its mass being coconut core or peat moss so that it can compress, but still have plenty of pore space. And do you need different size soil blocks for different plants? Ask oh. Cliff. What a wonderful question. Yeah, so um, the large, this version is good for just about everything, especially for four week old or less transplants. They, there are minis, which are amazing. Oh, pardon. <laughs> there are mini blockers, which are fabulous because they imagine instead of being two inches above your heat mat, they're a quarter inch above your heat mat. So seeds that need extra heat to germinate like peppers, like eggplants, tomatoes, also those just kind of small and slow to start seeds like lavender and oregano and thyme. It's nice to have those in the mini blocks so they can be right on the heat mat and they germinate in a fraction of the time. So that's where the mini blockers are awesome. You can also get larger size um, blockers too. And, um, but honestly, if you're going to get one size that is the most versatile, um, get yourself just the standard one and a half or two inch size. Um, either of those are super versatile and fabulous. And I think we've gotten everything that's in the chat, unless anybody has something more to pop in there. Hi, I just wrote this. Um, but so when it comes to sunlight from plants that don't require like a full amount of sunlight, are you going to model that with the seed initially? Like, are you going to put them in, you know, like cilantro doesn't want like that much sunlight. So would you put their seed in like that many, that like two to three hours of sunlight? Or would you grow it in full sunlight like your other seeds? Wonderful question. When you're growing seedlings, you want them to have 16 to 18 hours of light. Okay. And so regardless of whether they could thrive in shade, you want yeah. to give them all the dreamy, dreamy resources so that as seedlings, they can be the most vibrant possible. And it's really critical too. I'm so glad that you mentioned cilantro. There are seeds to direct sow only. And cilantro is one of them. Cilantro hates being transplanted. And how many of you grow cilantro that bolts way too soon? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that issue. And it, cilantro bolts too soon, bolts quickly because it's stressed. And okay. it gets stressed because it has too much heat or too much water, too few nutrients, or it was transplanted. So take a look on, our, on the back of all of our seeds. It's a, we'll have a little handy side reference and it has direct so 
if it needs to be direct sewn or transplanted, if it's only transplanted, or like in the case of spinach, it says direct sew or transplant. So you'll see on the back of cilantro, it would say direct sew only. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, my huge pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy the season. <laughs> Is this is this uh, same issue with dill? Because the the annual herbs that I've grown that bolted were cilantro and dill. Exactly, dill and cilantro are prime prime in that category. Okay, so I'm better off direct sowing them every okay. time. Every time. Okay, thank and you. Terry wonders what temperature would you start spinach at? Well, here's spinach is interesting. It can germinate colder. Its optimum germination temperature is actually more like 60 degrees. So less than the 75 degrees of most plants, but it can germinate um, much, 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 much colder. Actually, I got that wrong. So here is, here's the range. It can germinate from like 45, 50 degrees to like 75 is its optimum. So it, right at different, if it's 75 degrees, it's gonna germinate in four or five days. If it's 45, 50 degrees, like the soil is there. <laughs> The snow has just melted. You've just planted spinach. It might take three plus weeks for that seed to germinate in that soil. And it likely will. They can germinate at that temperature, but it's not their optimum germination temperature. So um, in terms of your house and starting transplants of spinach indoors, 75 degrees on a heat mat, they're going to go for it. Um, something, I mean, more about, I wouldn't actually recommend putting them on a heat mat because they can above 70 degrees. They're like, oh, 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 and then they stop germinating, which is why spinach is a school season crop. And we can't grow spinach here in the, in zone five on our farm. Spinach really doesn't germinate well in the summer. Perhaps you've noticed. Asian spinach tatsoi is incredible. And that does germinate all throughout the season. Um, so that's our, we grow spinach in the spring and fall, a tatsoi Asian spinach in the summer. Um, and thanks so much for asking. And soon enough, we'll be planting our spinach. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, Pamela would love to come visit the farm, but you're saying after the pandemic, right? Yes. You know, we will, if you're local to us, we will be having some days where we are sharing our transplants from the farm and you can do on-farm pickup also. Um, so we had, so there, if you're local, you can, there are those little opportunities to visit us, albeit it's basically just to pick up your plants and seeds and wave from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, post pandemic, stay tuned for our events. We have lots of different events throughout the summer. Um, and how local is local? Honestly, that's up to you. If, if you want to drive to us, <laughs> we will happily <laughs> share our seeds and transplants. There's this wonderful woman that we met years ago at the Boston Flower Show. And she every year comes and picks up like five or six flats of transplants from us and drives and makes like a whole weekend, <laughs> a Finger Lakes weekend around picking up her transplants and seeds. It's very lovely. Um, but <laughs> I wouldn't wish that, upon, I wouldn't wish driving six hours upon anyone <laughs> to just pick up some, some transplants, even if they're really nice and certified organic in a beautiful place. <laughs> So, so local is up to you. <laughs> okay. And I think that's it, except we do have the drawing for the perpetual calendar. I wanted to ask if Mary Whitkin has already asked her question. She seems to have her hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I did ask my question. It was about the dill. I was trying to figure out how to unput my, how to take my hand down and I, <laughs> didn't figure it out. Okay. I'll figure it out. <laughs> but, but I actually have a different question. Can you spend a few minutes, if you have any time left, to talk about flowers? Because I have collected flower mm -hmm. seeds, both wildflowers, uh, particularly milkweed, uh, and other things, and have not had a whole lot of luck 
either trying to start them from pots or direct sewing them, but perhaps I'm not doing direct sewing correctly. No, wild plants are wild plants. And we take for granted these garden varieties that we have just kind of grow for us. They've been growing us for thousands of years, co-adapting with us for thousands of years and releasing some of their recalcitrant wild behaviors. Similarly to like dogs are not wolves. <laughs> so like wolves are a lot harder to manage. And so sometimes wild seeds do just germinate pretty easily, but other times, they are their own beautiful beings that have a little different requirements than how we've been adapting and co-ed adapting with all these other varieties for years. So often that's where soil blocks are so handy because any kind of being root bound or not having that great airflow is really stressful for wild plants. All of our wild seeds just so clearly thrive in soil blocks. Also stratification is important with a lot of wild seeds. So mimicking that like freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw. So that is so critical in this so that your seeds are thinking that they have experienced something like fall, like winter, like spring. And so for milkweed seeds, we put, you know, put them in a little plastic bag with a damp paper towel inside and tuck it in your fridge. And for three, four weeks, let them stratify there. And so that's kind of mimicking that stage of spring. And so they germinate. We do cold stratify them, as in we put them in our freezer for a number of months before we share them with, with the world so that they have a higher germination potential, but that stratification will vary. Um, very clearly increase your germination as well. And I'm so glad you asked. There's so much more to share and I'd love to share too. And perhaps you have already heard, and if not, this is your cordial invitation. Through the end of May, we're sharing free weekly webinars similar to this, but instead of more broad, like this morning, pardon me this evening, like today, <laughs> <laughs> we're going deep into a subject. So this upcoming Monday, we're diving deep into just onions and leeks. What are all the details around garden planning and sowing and cultivating onions and leeks together? And we'll be going through till the end of May weekly, just deep dives with those, with each of those. So we'll be talking about flowers for a few of those. Um, so again, that's a free webinar series and you can join us on, you'll find the link on our website, fruitionseeds.com under learn. Um, and you can also just, you know, we'll send in the follow-up email to this gathering. I'll send, you'll, I'll send you all a link to that as well. So, and if you register, you can join us live and ask questions, but you'll also have access to the recordings as well. Thank so, you. Oh my God, my huge pleasure. Thank you for sowing seeds of wild plants. You are delightful. <laughs> well, part of the reason for coming to this 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 Zoom class is because my luck is pretty much nil. <laughs> <laughs> we can be friends. Let me count the ways. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. I I have drawn the two names from the hat. Constance Spuff, are you here? Looks like, oh no, that's Petra. Is Constance <laughs> here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yay. I had a calendar winner. So, <laughs> oh great, thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll put my video on for that one. <laughs> <laughs> How about Marianne McCormick in the house? Marianne McCormick. Yeah, yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Okay, so you won the second calendar. So we'll be in oh, touch. thank you. Get that to you. Okay. And Stu, I don't know. Do you have some more slides or some? 
No, I think I'll, I'll hand it back to Petra to close out the evening. Uh, well, Karen, I'd love to just read those same quotes from Robin Wall Kimmerer and send us them away. And this is part of a whole garden planning inspired by Robin Wall Kimmerer that we created, but you'll also find on our website. So, and this is, you can also, it has a little clickable um, okay. links in full color, but also has a black box for everybody. Lots of wonderful questions so that we can be really grown by our gardens this year and for generations to come. I think that the service berries show us another model, one based upon reciprocity rather than accumulation, where wealth and security come from the quality of your relationships, not from the illusion of self-sufficiency. Without gift relationships with bees and birds, the service berry would disappear from the planet. Even if they hoarded all their abundance perching atop the wealth ladder, they would not save themselves from the fate of extinction if their partners did not share in their abundance. Hoarding won't save us, friends. All flourishing is mutual. All flourishing is mutual. So thank you for keeping me warm on this beautifully bitter cold evening in February. It's a joy to think about seeds and starting them with you all. And thank you again to Dirty Gaia and the Rhinecliff Library for hosting such an extraordinary evening. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Petra. Until next you, Petra. time, don't be shy. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.